You have finally made it to module 10. Congrats! There's just one more short module to go and you are officially an expert in bacteriology. Okay, perhaps not an expert, but hopefully this journey has been a very informative and dare I say entertaining one. For more expertise, you can always use the supplemental resources in the course and the resources page at freemeded.org. If there is enough interest, perhaps an infectious disease course will be in the not too distant future. For the polymorphs, we have two main genus to talk about, Chlamydia and Rickettsia. Though Coxiella and Mycoplasma can also fit into this category, they were covered in another module, so we don't have to repeat them here. Erlecchia and Anaplasma are also much less frequent pests, but still worth having a passing knowledge of. Polymorph simply means that the bug changes shape with its environment. So unlike cocci and bacilli that generally hold their shape, these bugs can look different under the microscope, depending on other factors. Of the three genus in this module, chlamydia is no doubt the most popular due to its non-ulcerative genital diseases, but there are several species of medical relevance to consider. First, let's go over the complexity of C. trachomatis. It's the most difficult for students initially due to the three serotype divisions seen. One affects the genitals, one affects the lymph nodes, and one the eyes. Serotypes D through K are the ones concerning for genital disease, such as urethritis. Like other causes of inflammation of the urogenital tract, severe or untreated disease can cause inflammation in a retrograde manner. For women, this means inflammation of the reproductive tract and pelvic inflammatory disease. The end result can be sterility. As you can see, there's a mnemonic to remember that serotypes D through K affect a particular part of the human anatomy. Though the mnemonic is for the male reproductive anatomy, remember that urogenital diseases are more common in female patients. The other two serotype groups are much less notable. The L serotypes cause a disease of the lymph nodes and lymphatic system, generally in the inguinal region. Remember that L is for lymph node. For the A through C serotypes, they affect the eyes. The trachoma, as in the name C. trachomatis, is an eye infection. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the prevalence of this disease worldwide is around 41 million individuals. Trichiasis starts with a mild itching and conjunctivitis, but later leads to corneal ulcers and scars the tissue, ending in blindness. For the A through C serotype, think of C for conjunctivitis. Besides the genital and eye concerns of C. trachomatis, we also run into our very last of the atypical pneumonias with C. pneumoniae. Like M. pneumoniae, C. pneumoniae can linger for several weeks with mild but persistent symptoms. It can cause infection to much of the upper respiratory tract, and severe symptoms can even display meningitis and myocarditis. Unfortunately for those with pet birds or hobbies involving close contact with the flying dinosaurs, C. cytaki, or C. cytosy, is another disease to be cautious of. Cytokosis, otherwise known as parrot fever, parrot disease, and a host of other similarly themed nicknames causes a diverse pneumonia-like disease. It can range from barely symptomatic to severe and systemic. If keeping pets, having the cage and environment cleaned regularly can help prevent the spread from fecal dust and contaminants. The first of the Rickettsiaceae family is Rickettsia rickettsii. The generic names are not my favorite. I much prefer when the pathogen and diseases are named for what they do instead of where they belong on a list. Luckily, it has a very distinct disease associated with it, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This rickettsiosis disease is a tick-borne illness that most often starts with vague sick symptoms and a petechial rash. About 10% of people don't have a rash or show up to the doctor's office several days after the rash has resolved. Later disease can lead to respiratory failure, limb necrosis and amputation, and other organ failures. Not catching this disease in its early stages can be fatal, so a thorough history should be taken from the patient. It is a rare disease and is nationally reported if discovered. R. typhi can cause marine typhus and endemic typhus. Unlike the tick-borne cousin, R. typhi is spread by fleas and lice. Patients often present a few weeks after being infected with severe flu-like symptoms and a high fever. Sometimes it is difficult to distinguish this from RMSF, Lyme disease, or Q fever as they can all present with these vague flu-like symptoms for several weeks in duration. What sets typhus apart is usually the high fever. For the last section in this tier, we'll cover Erlechia and Anaplasma. These are also tick-borne illnesses. 
Here's a good time to mention briefly that most people have a lot of bad advice when it comes to tick removal. Don't use a matchstick, Vaseline, or other topical. The CDC recommends the one thing that all the lore says you should never do. Simply remove the tick with tweezers. Ehrlichiosis is spread by the Lone Star tick, same as tularemia, and anaplasmosis by the Ixodes tick, just like Lyme disease. This is likely the most common mistake on testing, seeing a particular tick and jumping to the more common disease, so be aware of these similarities. Like the others in this family, anyone with a nonspecific fever should be considered for these arthropod vector diseases. Fever, myalgia, fatigue, and other flu-like symptoms are seen here too. In reality, without a good way to differentiate based on presentation and history, it might be a safer idea just to send out serology for all of these bacteria. And now for some patient cases. A patient enters your walk-in clinic with a complaint of sore throat and a staccato cough. You can barely make out what they are saying as they have lost their voice, which is the most likely disease. Though we have three main concerns for an atypical pneumonia and chronic cough, laryngitis is more frequently seen in C. pneumoniae. This is a great symptom to differentiate it from others if present. Due to its mild presentation, we would hope to see this patient in a clinic setting and not in the emergency department. An old buzzword that you may or may not see anymore is the staccato cough, which is characterized by inspiration between each cough. A young male comes to the office regarding a recent swelling in the inside of his left thigh. When asked if he is sexually active, he states yes. On further probing, he does not always use protection. What serotype is likely the cause of his swelling? This is likely lymphogranuloma venereum. Inguinal lymph node swelling is a common presentation on exam questions. An actor comes in complaining of diarrhea and cough for the past few days. He is a pirate and travels around with the Renaissance Fair. We could have guessed something like this, as he is in the office still wearing his costume. You also notice that there are bird droppings on his lapel and inquire. The actor states that he has a pet parrot as part of his act, but lucky for us, left the bird at home. What is the most likely disease state of this patient? Without the clue of the pet bird, it would be extremely difficult to point out psittacosis as a potential cause for his illness. Watch out for any occupation or hobby related to birds. A worker at a meat and poultry plant is complaining of fever, cough, and muscle aches that began two days ago. Three other people in the plant have also become sick with similar symptoms. Which of the diseases in this module are most likely responsible for this outbreak? Again, we have psittacosis. Were you fooled thinking we wouldn't put the same disease in twice? Though rare, some diseases like psittacosis can have such variable presentations and history that another question seemed in order. Poultry, even already dead, is still a bird. This processing plant can spread the bacteria from the diseased bird to others rapidly, and has led to at least one outbreak this year alone. And for the final patient of this course. A young girl is brought in by her mother due to being sick for the past few weeks and is not going away. Physical exam is normal, except for a slight fever. He asks about where the girl likes to play, and the mother states that she plays outside a lot with her friends, and they go into a patch of wilderness near their community. Which of these diseases is most likely present in the area? Here we are probably looking at a case of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Even though we don't see the rash currently, she may have had one before. In fact, asking the mother about this after the initial diagnosis confirms that she did have a rash previously, but it faded away yesterday. Also note, the actual question wasn't, what does this girl have, but what is the more common disease in this geographic location? Test writers sometimes give lengthy vignettes that aren't really necessary to answer the question. This is especially common for certain tick-borne or fungal diseases that are more prevalent in certain geographies. When it comes to the living environment, it's important to note that chlamydia genus are more like viruses in that they are mostly intracellular. Most of the more common pathogenic bacteria stay on the outside of the cells and move around in the extracellular spaces. This is also why infected cells might be classified on exams as having cytoplasmic inclusions. Even though chlamydia is technically gram-negative, it stains poorly. This makes sense considering it lives mostly inside the cells, which protect it from the stains. Typically, a swab from the patient is the first step in the diagnosis of C. trachomatis, or even a urine sample will suffice. It's a quick and cheap procedure, but can be a bit uncomfortable. 
Many physicians are under the impression that this methodology should be thrown out entirely, but for now it is still a potential question to be aware of. The next step would be a DNA probe. For C. trachomatis, you will hear of the Nucleic Acid Amplification Test, or NAT. Please see the optional resources list for videos on how this procedure is completed. It seems that many resources are now stating that NAT should be the first line. As more research comes out claiming more benefits for NAT, this is likely to be more widely accepted as a first line diagnostic step, making the swab a thing of the past. Now, assuming that we have a blood sample and perform a blood smear, there is another test that we could think of. Though not recommended due to its low sensitivity, you might run into a question regarding the Gimsa stain or Gimsa stain. This stain is usually used for fungal and protozoal infections more so, but it was also used for chlamydia in the past. It's more likely to be an incorrect distractor nowadays. Eosinophilia can also be seen on blood counts in chlamydia infections, usually more associated with respiratory disease. Any respiratory infection is also likely to benefit from a chest x-ray and allows physicians to assess for other potential causes of the symptoms. Chlamydia is unique in that it is one of the few bacteria, and only one we will cover, that doesn't have muramic acid in its cell wall. This unique difference is thought to be why it's resistant to beta-lactams that affect certain cell wall structures. This genus also lacks the ability to produce its own energy, which is in the form of ATP. This has labeled it an energy parasite. Although the mechanics are beyond this course, disrupting the pathway that allows chlamydia to collect intracellular ATP could be used as a method for future microbial treatment. This bacteria also exists in two forms, an elementary body and a reticulate body. The elementary body is spherical, non-replicating, and is the infectious part of this semi-parasitic bacteria. The reticulate is a larger intracellular form that replicates. For rickettsia, the wheel felix disease is a classic. It's a serologic test, like many previously discussed, so we're looking for antibodies in the blood. But with a sensitivity around 30% and specificity in the 40s, this is not a test we use much anymore. These are also intracellular microbes and very small, making the normal staining techniques less than ideal. Some recent studies show genetic markers that suggest that rickettsia genus is closely related to the mitochondria in human cells, giving more evidence to the argument that mitochondria are ancient bacteria that set up shop in our cells a long time ago. Despite the wheel felix being a good question fodder, the CDC recommends that immunofluorescence is the standard for diagnosis of rickettsia. PCR and ELISA may be alternatives, but not currently the first line recommendation. Testing for rickettsial illness is often used to distinguish between other rare diseases and vague symptoms, such as Q fever. Due to the rareness of these infections, there is less statistical evidence for some of the diagnostic testing. For exams, the CDC recommendations are usually going to suffice. Again, we see the dermacanter tick as a method of spread. After all these little parasite-related diseases, I'd recommend going out and buying a lot of bug spray before your next outing. Though we have a lot of diseases that can cause a rash, RMSF is unique in its spread. It usually starts on the periphery with the palms, wrists, and soles or ankles. Then it moves to the center of the body. Lastly, we have the Anaplasma and Ehrlichia genus. These are exceedingly rare, so don't worry too much about all the details. Here are some key points. Depending on the state of the disease, certain diagnostic tests are more sensitive for different periods of time. In general, PCR would be your first choice for either of these diseases. A marula may be seen on blood smear early in the disease. If seen, this is pretty much diagnostic for the disease. Like all arthropod-based diseases, be aware that co-infections can be a concern. This is more of a concern with the Ixodes tick. If only these diseases affected the ticks and fleas first, maybe they would never make it to us. This module helps to reinforce some concepts we discussed in the last module. As these bacteria do not have the typical cell wall structures, most cell wall inhibiting antibiotics are not going to be very effective. In either of the chlamydia species, a macrolide or tetracycline can be the first line. Macrolides are easier to remember as they are first line for atypical pneumonias. You shouldn't have a question with both of these answers on it, but doxycycline can also be considered a first line. However, many times a patient with C pneumonia is below the age of 10, so a tetracycline would be contraindicated. For a case of vaginosis or vaginitis, we could easily think of another infectious cause and incorrectly treat with metronidazole. Be sure to complete a proper diagnostic workup and treat appropriately. 
For the others, treatment gets a little tricky. Normally we say all tick-borne diseases gets a tetracycline, except kids and pregnancy. Of course, there is an exception to every rule, and here's a big one. Though for any other disease we have covered, children should avoid doxycycline due to the potential for serious or permanent side effects, this doesn't apply here. Rickettsia can be very debilitating and even lethal, and since it is intracellular, your body has more difficulty fighting it off. We have to risk the antibiotic side effects to make sure to kill off the bug. For Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, follow the same rules. Here are a few take-home images that might help your studies. We didn't really concentrate too much on intracellular versus extracellular pathogens throughout these modules, mostly concentrating on the vectors and reservoirs to indicate potential modes of spread. But if you can remember which bacteria fit into each category, it can also help to shed light on their potential diseases. As a general rule, it might be easier to remember that the extracellular are more likely to show up on gram stain. The intracellular are more likely to require special testing for diagnosis, but there are exceptions to every rule. Here is a simple antibiotic list by bacteriostatic and bactericidal mechanisms. It's not an extensive list, but these are some of the more common antibiotics and classes used currently. And here is one last broad overview of what we have covered, and a few that we didn't. You have now made it through the 10 modules of pathogenic bacteria. Depending on how much you have retained and how much of the optional and advanced resources given you have used, you now have the majority of the information needed for medical school studies, as well as board exams and clinical knowledge on this subject. But can you synthesize the information in a useful manner? Board exams are becoming less likely to ask about the medical microbiology in isolation, and more likely to combine with clinical factors. Being able to recall the facts discussed in these lectures and building upon them is the only way to match microbiology with infectious disease topics. On its own, this information can be either fun or daunting, but only when combined with virology, mycology, and parasitology can we get a full view of the pathogenic nature of microbes. Being able to make a differential diagnosis between all of these sciences leads to the study of infectious disease and the skills necessary clinically. A quick advanced learner tip, if you plan to utilize mnemonic training and memory palaces for your studies, go back and download the transcripts of these lectures from YouTube, or screenshot the relevant material in video. You can use these as a guide for creating the appropriate mnemonics for long-term retention. A final note, hundreds of hours went into creating this material. If you believe it to be a useful source and are currently watching the free videos on our YouTube channel, consider making a donation at freemeded.org. Or if you prefer another way to help us grow, do share our material with others and direct them to our links. We wish you the best of luck on your future studies and hope you will continue to use free med ed material to help you on this journey.